Chapter 5. The Principle of Ancient Evidence Only Examined The Principle of Ancient Evidence Only Examined Divine Safeguards to the Sacred Text The Evidential Value of Late Manuscripts Errors of Omission An Illustrative Test of the Comparative Values of an Earlier and Later Manuscript The Strength of the case for the revised text. We come now to the examination of the principle adopted by the various editors of the Greek text of the Bible, a principle that was imposed upon the revision committee, though that imposition was accomplished in such a way as hereafter pointed out that many of them apparently was not aware of that until they disbanded. We fully admit that the principle of following the most ancient manuscript is, on its face, reasonable and safe. For it is indisputable that other things being equal, the copies nearest to the original autographs are most likely to be freest from errors. If therefore it were a question of whether or not we should follow, in the fashioning of the Greek text, the earliest, as against later manuscripts, there would be no question at all for all would agree. But, as the case actually stands, it is impossible for us to follow the earliest manuscripts for the simple reason that they no longer exist. Not a single copy of the many thousands that were made, circulated and read in the first three centuries is known to exist today. We do not have versions and patristic quotations that date back to the second century, and these, according to the principle we are discussing, are entitled to great weight. Is it not strange, therefore, that those who justify their course of appealing to, and by professing to follow blindly the, that principle, should cast it aside and accept the reading of fourth century codices, but these are in conflict with second century versions and quotations? Seeing then that the earliest manuscripts are no longer in existence, we cannot follow them. And hence, it is clear that the problem which confronts us is one that cannot be solved by application of the simple rule we are discussing. Briefly, the situation is this. We have, on the one hand, the Greek text of 1611, which served as the basis for the authorised version, a text that represents and agrees with a thousand manuscripts going back as far as the 5th century, and with versions and quotations going back to the 2nd. As to this, there is no dispute at all, for doctors Westcourt and Hawke admit the existence of this text, and even assume that it was discussed and approved by conventions of the Eastern Church as early as the 3rd century, on the other hand, we have the Codex Vaticanus, Sinaiticus and Beza supposedly dating, as to the first two, from the 4th century and to the last from the 6th, which manuscripts present thousands of divergences, omissions, additions and substitutions, transpositions and modifications from the received text. Upon such a state of things, the question presented for discussion is this. Shall we stand by the received text, accepting corrections of therefore wherever they can be established by preponderation proof and putting those ancient codices on the level of other witnesses to be tested as to the, their credibility like all others? Or shall we abandon the Texas Receptus in favour of that of the Westcott and Hort or of some other of the half dozen that profess to be shaped by principles of following the ancient manuscripts. This is the question we propose to discuss in the present chapter. It should be observed before we proceed with this question that the agreeing testimony, where they do agree, of the Vatican and the Sinaitic manuscripts cannot properly be regarded as having the force of two independent witnesses, for there are sufficient evidences, both internal and external to warrant the conclusion that these two codices are very closely related, that they are in fact copies of the same original, itself 
a very corrupt transcript of the New Testament. For while it is admitted, on the other hand, that the text used as the basis of the authorised version correctly represents a text known to have been widely, if not everywhere, in use as early as the second century. For the Bushito, the Old Testament Latin versions, corroborated by patristic quotations, afford ample proof of that. On the other hand, it is not known that the two codices we are discussing represents anything but copies of a bad original, made worst in the copying. Divine Safeguard to the Text It is appropriate at this point to direct attention to the divinely ordained means which has thus so far protected the sacred text from serious corruptions. He who gave to men the Holy Scriptures to serve throughout the ages as the sure foundation of that faith of the Son of God, which also avails for personal salvation and to be also the sufficient rule of life and conduct for the household of faith, has not failed to devise effectual means for the preservation of his written word. The means in question are concerning are according to God's usual way of containing the line of a living thing, incidental to and inherent in the thing itself, and not something extraneous thereto. For it is part of the normal life of every individual to provide for the continuance and multiplication of individuals of its own kind. Thus, as the grain supplies not only bread to the eater, but also seed to the sower, so, in like manner, God has provided that his living word should both feed every generation of saints and should also increase and multiply itself, as it is written, and the word of God increased, Acts 6, 7. And again, but the word of God grew and multiplied, Acts 12, 24. And once more, so mighty grew the word of God and prevailed, Acts 19, 20. The means which mainly have served to accomplish the purpose referred to are these. 1. The necessity that there should be a great and steady increase in multiplication of copies, for this provides automatically the most effectual security imaginable against the corruption of the text. This point has an important bearing on the question we are now examining. 4. Remembering that we have no actual copies, i.e. original Greek texts, so old as the Syriac and the Latin versions, i.e. translations, by probably more than 200 years. The traditional text, Bergen and Miller, and that the oldest versions are far more ancient than the oldest Greek manuscripts, Canon Cook, and remembering too that these venerable versions prove the existence in the earlier day of a standard text agreeing essentially with our Texas Receptus, and it will be recognised that the most ancient evidence is all in favour of the latter. 3. The activity of the earliest assailants of the Church necessitated on the part of the defenders of the faith, and that from the very beginning, that they should quote extensively from every part of the New Testament, in this way also a vast amount of evidence of the highest credibility as to the true reading of disputed passages has been accomplished and has come down to us in the writings of so-called Christian fathers. But of what avail would all these checks safeguards have been if men had been allowed to follow a principle so obviously unsound as that the most ancient manuscripts are to have the deciding voice in every dispute. However, God can be trusted to see to it that all attempts to sweep away his protective means should fail, as in this case. The value of comparatively late manuscripts. It is quite true that most of the extant copies of the Greek New Testament date from the 10th or 14th century. Thus, they are separated from the inspired original writings by a thousand years or more. Yet that they faithfully represent these originals and that the concurrence of a large majority of them would accurately decide 
every disputed reading. No reasonable person should ever doubt. The extant texts of secular writings of antiquity, Herodotus, Cyclades, Sophocles, are but few in comparison with the thousand manuscripts of the scriptures and are separated from their original some 500 additional years. Moreover, they lack the extraordinary safeguards mentioned above, whereby the integrity of the scriptures has been protected. Yet no one doubts that we have correct text of those ancient writers. So the fact is that the security which the text of the scriptures has enjoined us, as has been well said, although unique and extraordinary. Errors of omission. In considering the principle of following the most ancient manuscripts, it is important to note how it works in the case of that commonest of all errors, errors of omission. And in discussing this point, we would take as an example the question of the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark, referred to specifically later on. These verses are absolutely necessary in the completeness of the Gospel. Yet, because they are not in the two most ancient manuscripts, the revisionists have marked them as probably spurious. Here then we may propose a question upon which the merits of the BV may be decided, at least to a very large extent. Should the purely negative testimony of those two codices, i.e. the fact that certain words and passages are not found in them, be allowed to overthrow the affirmative testimony of a hundreds of other Greek manuscripts, versions and quotations from the Church Fathers. This is a question which anyone of ordinary intelligence can be trusted to decide correctly, when the following points to which Dr Hort and the majority of the Revision Committee must have been strangely blinded are taken into account. 1. The commonest of all mistakes in copying manuscripts or in repeating a matter are mistakes of omission or lapses of memory or the result of inattention. Hence it is an acceptable principle of evidence that the testimony of one competent witness who says he saw or heard a certain thing carries more weight than of a dozen who, though on the spot, can only say that they did not see or hear it, or that they did not remember it. Wherefore, other things being equal, the affirmative evidence of the other three ancient codices and versions, and that of the fathers who quote these verses, are unquestioned scripture, is an hundredfold, more worthy of credence than the negative testimony of the two which are allowed to control in setting the text of the RV. 2. As we have already stated, the superstitious difference was paid to the Sinai and Vatican manuscripts because of their supposed greater antiquity, an assumption being that the older the manuscript, the more likely to be correct. But this assumption is wholly unwarrantable. In the concrete case before us, we have in support of the text of the authorised version. The concurrent testimony of many manuscripts from many different parts of the world, and though these were copies of older copies no longer in existence, yet upon the soundest principle of the law of evidence, their concurrent testimony serves to establish a conclusive the various disputed passages where the two ancient codices present variances. The question authenticity of the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark is of such importance that we propose to cite the testimony in regard thereto more fully in a subsequent chapter. We are referring to it here only as an impressive illustration of a general principle. That principle, the cause of errors of omission, is of exceptional importance in this case because we have seen the original scribes of the Sinaitic Codices was peculiarly given to errors of that sort. A test of the principle of ancient evidence. Let us take an illustration of what we are seeking to establish, namely, the concurrent testimony of the manuscripts which support the received text conclusively establishes its authenticity 
in parts where it differs from the Greek, the New Greek text of Westcott and Hort. For this purpose, let us suppose that a hundred copies of a certain original document in a central business office were made by different copyists and sent to as many different branches in various parts of the world. And suppose that, since the document contained directions for the carrying out of the business for many generations, it had to be copied again and again as the individual manuscripts were worn out through usage. Suppose, further, that after centuries of time, one of the earliest copies should turn up, which upon examination was found to lack a word or sentence found in a latter copy in actual service, and that it were deemed important to settle the question of the authenticity of that word or sentence. Suppose further that, for the purpose in view, a dozen of the manuscripts then in actual use in various and far distant parts of the world, each one being a late copy of the previously used and worn out copies were examined, and that the disputed word or sentence were found in each of those late copies. Is it not clear that the authenticity thereof would be established beyond all reasonable dispute? Such must be the conclusion, because the absence thereof in the ancient copy could be easily accounted for, whereas its presence in a number of later copies, each of which came from a distinct source, could not be accounted for except on the assumption of its genuineness. But let us suppose that, in addition to the various copies in use in various places, there existed certain translations, versions in foreign languages, which translations were earlier than the very earliest of the existing manuscripts in the original tongue, and also that many quotations of the disputed passages were found in the writings of persons who had lived in or near the days when the document itself was written. And suppose that the disputed word or sentence were found in every translation and every quotation, would not its genuineness be established beyond the faintest shadow of doubt? This superstitious case will give a good idea of the strength of the evidence in favour of the text of the AV. For in the settling of the text due weight was given to the concurrent testimony of the numerous manuscripts in actual use in different churches, widely separated one from another, and also to the corroborating testimony of the most ancient versions and of the patristic writings, whereas in the setting of the text of the EV, the evidence of highest grade was uniformly rejected in favour of the lowest grade. The strength of the case in favour of the received text. 3. But the case in favour of the Greek text of the AV is far stronger than this, for when the two manuscripts which controlled the Westcott and Hort text are scrutinised, they are found to contain such internal proofs of their unreliability as to impeach their own testimony and render them utterly unworthy of belief. They present the case of witnesses who have been caught in so many misstatements as to discredit their entire testimony. To begin with, their history renders them justly open to suspicion. 4. Why should a special manuscript be carefully treasured in the Vatican? if not for the reason that it contained errors and textual corruptions, favourable to the doctrines and practices of Rome. And why was the other manuscript discovered in the last century by Tissendorf, allowed to lie in disuse for hundreds of years from the 4th century, as supposed, until the 19th? A reasonable inference would be that the manuscript was cast aside and ultimately consigned to the waste paper basket, because it was known to be permeated with errors of various sorts, and this inference is raised to the level of practical certainty by the fact that time and again the work of correcting the entire manuscript was undertaken by successive owners. But not to dwell longer upon mere circumstances, the two manuscripts, when carefully examined, are found to bear upon their face clear evidence that they were derived from a common and very corrupt source. The late Dr Edward Vining of Cambridge Mass 
has gone through thoroughly into this and has produced evidence tending to show that they were copies and most carelessly made of an original brought by Oregon out of Egypt, where, as is well known, the scriptures were corrupted almost from the very beginning in the interest of some ascetic practices as now characterised the Church of Rome. Dr Scrivener, generally regarded as the ablest of all the textual critics, says that the worst corruptions to which the New Testament has ever been subjected originated within a hundred years after it was composed, and that Arrhenus and the African Fathers used far inferior manuscripts to those employed by Stonica or Erasmus or Stevens, 13 centuries later, when moulding the Texas Receptus. In view of such facts as these, it is easy to see what havoc would result to the sacred text if, as actually happened in the production of the RV, its composition were controlled by two manuscripts of Egyptian origin, to the actual repudiation of the consensus of a hundred of later manuscripts of good repute, of the most ancient and trustworthy of versions, and of the independent witnesses of the earliest Christian writers. 4. Bearing in mind that, as Dr. Canyon of the British Museum says, the manuscripts of the New Testament are counted by hundreds and even thousands. It is a cause for astonishment that credence should have been given to any instances to the Vatican or Sinai manuscripts, or both together, in cases where they agree, against the agreeing testimony of the multitude of opposing witnesses. But such was the rule consistently followed in complying with the text for the BV. Canon Cook, in his book on the revised version of the first three Gospels, says, By far the greatest number of innovations, including those which gave the severest shock to our minds, are adopted on the testimony of two manuscripts, or even of one manuscript, against the distinct testimony of all other manuscripts, unisal and cursive. Footnote 5. For some centuries after Christ, all Greek manuscripts were written entirely in capital letters. Such manuscripts, the most ancient, are called unisal. In later times, the custom of using capitals at the beginning only of a sentence, or for the proper names, came into existence. This style of writing is called cursive. The Vatican Codex, sometimes alone, but generally in accord with the Sinaitic, is responsible for nine-tenths of the most striking innovations in the RV. We have deemed it worthwhile to examine, with some care, the principle whereby modern editors of the Greek text in the New Testament profess to have been guided, and this for the reasons, first, that the question here discussed and the facts whereby it must be determined lie beyond the reach of most of those for whose benefit we are writing. And second, that if we are right in our views that the principle we are discussing is utterly unsound, is contrary to the rule of evidence, and it is certain to lead astray those who submit to its guidance, we have taken the foundation completely from under the revised version of the 1881, and of every other version that rests upon the same corrupt Greek text, or one constructed upon the same principles. We bring our remarks under this heading to a close by quoting the following from Scrivener's plain introduction to the text of the New Testament, 1833. Dr. Hort's system is entirely destitute of historic foundation, and again, we are compelled to repeat as emphatically as ever our strong conviction that the hypothesis to which Dr. Hort has devoted so many laborious years is destitute not only of historical foundation but of all probability resulting from the internal goodness of the text which its adoption would force upon us. He quotes Dr. Hort as saying, We cannot doubt that St. Luke 23.34 comes from an extraneous source and he replies, nor can we, on our part, doubt that the system which entails such consequences is hopelessly self-condemned. 
We conclude therefore from what has been under consideration up to this point in our inquiry that the EV should be rejected not only because of the many unsupported departures from the AV it contains but because the Greek text thereupon it is based was constructed upon a principle so unsound that the resulting text could not be other than hopelessly corrupt.